Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hump Day Hamer presentations brought to you by the fine members and supporting advertisers of supercub.org. Remember, you can watch this presentation or any of our past presentations anytime by visiting the Hump Day Hanger, the HDHP page on supercub.org, or just put supercub.org HDHP in your favorite search engine and it will find that page for you. If you've been around supercub.org for long, you know that fall is the time for our annual calendar campaign and membership drive. This will be all taking place very soon and is a great time to renew or begin your support of supercub.org and get some awesome calendars. The pictures are amazing this year. Stay tuned to supercub.org, join our mailing list, and uh, you'll get to know right away when these things are happening. So next month, on October 11th, Ted Waltman will be giving a presentation on his 2023 trip to Alaska. If you've seen any of the TED Talks of the past, you know they are very informative with some very stunning photos. This is no exception, so be sure to tune in for that one. For tonight's presentation, you can ask questions on the Zoom chat or on the YouTube chat. Um, if you're using the Zoom chat, you can message the presenter directly. Uh, if your question is of a personal matter, or you can message Laura and I directly, and we can kind of interrupt him and ask it as an anonymous person. Um, tonight's presenter is no stranger to many of you. Dr. Randy Corfman holds a, both a PhD and MD and is an aviation medical examiner. Randy is also the president of the Minnesota Pilots Association. He's an avid aviator, and you may not find a person anywhere more committed to introducing young people to aviation and supporting all of us in our efforts to stay in the air. Welcome, Randy. Thank you, Steve. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and uh, have a chance to share some ideas with you all. Um, I, I see some of the people that are here. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces. Um, you know, there's few things uh, dear closer to our hearts than keeping our medical certification going. And uh, um, so I think that uh, the options that we have now are so great compared to what we had uh, 15, 20 years ago in terms of staying um, um, certified to, to stay in the air. And, um, and that's gonna change in a more positive direction uh, in the next year or so, and we'll uh, hopefully have a, an update on that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, I'm going to start out here, uh, you know, the screen share here. Uh, you know, if anybody has any questions during the presentation, feel free to um, uh, put those, I guess, to the chat. Laura, would that be the best way for them to do it? Yep, through the chat. And I'll try to address anything that I can. Um, and so don't hesitate to share problems that a friend of yours might be having uh, so we can try to answer those. So we're gonna stream this one here. Um, I was telling uh, Steve and, uh, uh, yesterday, I believe, or maybe it was uh, Steve Tebow, my flight uh, instructor, that probably the best, one of the best uh, uh, presentations I ever gave was uh, one when I was, uh, uh, studying at Yale, and I got invited to go over to uh, New Jersey to give a, a grand rounds. And I was so excited about it because I was, you know, born and raised on a farm in Kansas. I really never left Kansas until I went back to Connecticut. And I uh, had rented a plane out of uh, Tweed, New Haven to fly over JFK down to New Jersey to give the talk. And, and I was pumped. I had my charts all ready to go. And I took off, went over JFK and looked down over Long Island. I went, man, this is amazing. Came in and landed. And the gentleman picked me up and said, Dr. Corfman, we just have like 15 miles to go to, to get to the pre uh, presentation location. And I reached back to get my bag and there were no slides there. I left my slides all back home in the car at the airport in New, in New Haven. And um, and it was a uh, it was a surgical technique uh, presentation, and so I'm just going. What am I going to do? And honestly, it was probably one of the best presentations I've ever given. That when you're not tied to PowerPoint slides, uh, there's some real freedom that comes with that. So we have PowerPoint slides some tonight, but please do feel free to let me know if you want to change gears and anything that comes up. So 
With that, we're gonna go back to the screen share. Um, there's nothing wrong with divine intervention. Um, so I'm not uh, putting that down for sure, but uh, we'd like to get through our flight physical without having to rely on divine uh, uh, intervention. And, uh, but I think that, uh, okay, now hold on here. Um, the pilot's prayer, God grant me the eyes of an eagle, the judgment of an owl, the quickness of a hummingbird, reflexes of a cat, the radar of a cave bat, the heart of a bull, and the balls of an army helicopter pilot. And Steve Lewis, if you're on, you probably can appreciate that. And please, oh, please help me pass my flight physical. So I think that even when I go in for my flight physical, I'm always nervous about it because I'm not sure. I want to make sure I pass it. Um, and I'm just not sure what I'm going to be running up against. You know, in the days before basic med, um, and uh, even now, uh, this is the what situation that we found ourselves in sometimes if we're going to a new aviation medical examiner that we didn't know. Um, we thought they were our friend, but sometimes they weren't our friend and things that they can put in your, uh, on your forms when they're doing the examination could be a major problem for you. Back in the days of the paper forms and nowadays with the, with the uh, MedExpress, one of the things to keep in mind about MedExpress is that if you uh, if you put something in your MedExpress form and um, they weren't sure about, um, you can ask your aviation medical examiner when they're going through the exam uh, if they can change it, and they can make that change. Uh, so we can make that change with your permission. Um, so. Uh, it's better to ask those questions before you hand your confirmation number to your aviation medical examiner, because one of the things to keep in mind you all is that that, that number, that confirmation number is your electronic uh, signature. And once that's given, and once I enter that into the computer to activate the examination, it's on record. So it kind of goes back to the days in the paper forms for those of you who remember what those are like that we, uh, you know, once you start filling out that paperwork, uh, you're committed. You can't just change your mind and walk out of the uh, examination at that point in time. Uh, so it's it's important. The same thing is true with the electronic signature with your confirmation number. Uh, don't give that up uh, easily. Um, I know that there are some places that they want that in advance so they can put that in the computer. But if something happens between the time you give them that confirmation number, the time they start the examination, you really cannot pull the plug on it at that point um, without some major hoops to jump through. The FAA has asked some significant questions about why was it that you didn't complete this examination? So just a word to the wise, make sure you can protect yourself by guarding that confirmation number uh, before you give it. Now, one of the things that uh, some people don't understand, and I think I wanted to kind of convey the differences between an aviation medical examiner and the basic med uh, examiner for uh, uh, basic med. An aviation medical examiner has to be a, an MD or a DO. Um, we have to go uh, to Oklahoma City to complete a uh, four and a half day uh, uh, course on how to do flight physicals and to talk about some uh, common scenarios and medical issues that arise for pilots. And then every three years, you have to do a two and a half day seminar um, at which they make sure they uh, make it clear to us that we serve at the pleasure of the federal air surgeon and that our designation can be yanked at any moment for any reason um, uh, without any recourse that we would have on that. So. Um, that it doesn't really, it didn't give me a really warm, fuzzy feeling. I know when I go each uh, these three years to these exam these seminars and, and have that put to, in my face once again. Um, we have to perform the medical examinations uh, per the specifications of the uh, Civ uh, Civil Aerospace Medical Institute. So it tells us exactly what we're supposed to be checking. We do not prescribe or treat and we're encouraged not to enter into a physician-patient relationship. Um, uh, Laura and Steve, I'm moving my uh, my mouse over that. Can you see that on the screen there? Okay, thank you. We so, can. Thank you. So we, we're encouraged not to enter into a physician-patient relationship. And um, uh, there are several reasons for that, one of which is that when we step outside of that, we are going back uh, 
and uh, leave the um, safety of the anonymity of the uh, FAA. Um, and I'll describe that a little bit later. For basic med examination, <clears throat> we have to be a state licensed physician, an MD, a DO, or a chiropractor in some states. Uh, actually, Minnesota is one of the states that uh, a chiropractor is considered to be a licensed physician. Uh, and I have some significant concerns about that um, that I won't go into now, but um, uh, it cannot be a nurse practitioner. It can't be a physician's assistant. Um, it can't be your dentist. Um, so not that dentists can't do a good examination, but uh, the FAA is not gonna recognize that. We perform the, the examination according to form 8700-2, uh, with a checklist. Uh, we'll go through that in some detail. Uh, we can diagnose, refer, and treat patients, and uh, we may choose to enter into a physician-patient relationship. But for me, um, most of the, the guys that I examine don't want me to be their gynecologist, so they kind of go, well, I don't really need you to be my primary physician. But I, saw, I see some people on this chat tonight that I am their gynecologist, and they are the uh, 46XY variation of human beings. So I think that uh, um, that's part of that. A basic med doc is akin to an a &P, uh, who finds a problem and provides repairs. An AME doc is akin to an IA, an AI, uh, who can inspect and make recommendations, but it's more of an inspection sort of thing. And in fact, I think uh, it's important to understand that. Um, this is Steve Pierce, who many of you know, uh, a terrific a and AI who gives uh, of himself endlessly to the members of this organization and many other organizations. Um, Steve and uh, this is Roger and Darren Meggers uh, with Super Cub number one that they rebuilt. Uh, I'm hoping that one of these days that uh, Darren and Roger will go through a, a hump day presentation about how they found and how they rebuilt Super Cub number one. For a &Ps, they can either do this by going to a trade school for two years, or they can do on-the-job uh, work for a certain number of thousands of hours, and then take the examination, a practical and a written examination. And then after they've been an a &P for a number of years, um, I think it's three years, they can then apply to be an IA, and they take a written examination for that. I'm not sure if there's a practical examination for that or not. The point with that is, is that, um, uh, there's a difference in the way that a uh, basic med doc looks at things and the AME doc. I am nothing more than a measure when it comes to the FAA. Uh, I don't interpret things. I'm just supposed to state the facts and measure the facts. For basic med, it's different because when we take the Hippocratic Oath, we're there to serve our patients. We're there to, to do our best to uh, provide uh, quality care for them based upon good prospective randomized studies, you know, and uh, it's a different sort of philosophy there. So I think that's why it's very difficult for uh, uh, some AMEs to be able to see a problem and really not feel, uh, they feel constrained by the FAA not to enter into trying to get that problem fixed. And so it's a different, uh, it's a different philosophy. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's something that we need to consider. Basic med, for those of you who don't know, you can fly with no more than five passengers, uh, fly an aircraft under 6,000 pounds. You're authorized to carry no more than six uh, occupants. Uh, you have to stay, or within the United States, you have to stay less than 250 knots and below 18,000 feet, which isn't a problem for most of us. Um, and you uh, can't fly for compensation or higher. I don't wanna get into how flight instructors can pull this off under basic med, but maybe if there's questions and someone knows the answer to that later, we can discuss it. The timeline comparison uh, I put here, you can see that for a basic med examination, you have the physical examination and you do the online part. And the physical examination is good for four years to the date of the examination. The online course, when you take the course and pass the test, it's good for two years to the end of the month that you did the examination. Okay, so there's a difference there. And then we'll show a little bit later how that can become a problem for you that it's, it's quite easy to fall in the laps where you, if you're flying under basic med, 
you may go through a period of time when you do not have a valid medical. If your physical examination has expired and yet you still think you're covered because of the online part. So it's important to kind of consider that. If you have a special issuance, it's not disqualifying for basic med. And you just have to one time, make sure that's all together. Um, you cannot have a denied, uh, removed, um, uh, you can let them lapse. Your medical, uh, your third class medical or second class medical or first class medical, you can let your special issuance lapse and go right into basic med until and if you happen to have another medical uh, event that becomes something that's necessary for special issuance. And we're going to talk about that in some detail. You can compare that to a person doing a third class medical is good for two years generally. And if you have a special issuance every year, you've got to uh, uh, do something to uh, re-up that uh, to get the authorization. And you get a letter from the FAA that is always a uh, uh, really a heartfelt letter from the FAA that says, you know, well, for those of you who've gotten them, they are just like, uh, uh, you know, you, you feel like you're on your deathbed and you're a criminal until you they reveal that with the good graces that we're giving, we are willing to give you a special issuance. So at any rate, that's that. Uh, pilot can uh, have to have a valid medical certificate after July 15th of 2006. That applies to both regular and special issuance. You have to have a driver's license, hold a medical certificate, answer the questions on the comprehensive medical examination checklist. We'll go through that in some detail. Get your physical examination by any state licensed physician, have them complete the form, and then take the online medical education course and complete the uh, uh, that. And uh, you have to check off that they can check the National Driver's License Registry. This The sequence of events of this can be changed. There are some pilots come in and do the basic med exam with me first, and then they do the online course. Uh, some do the online course and then do the uh, uh, basic med examination part after that. So I don't think it really makes any difference. Um, you qualify for it? Well, if you've ever had a, a first, second, or third class medical or special issuance, uh, anytime prior to 2006, you can. Uh, if you've had your medical revoked, suspended, withdrawn, or denied, you can't, which is really important to know as you're doing the gamesmanship for uh, the uh, medical, if you're medical, uh, to make sure that you if you get any of these things happen, you can't go to light sport, you can't go to basic med. So you got to go back and get a special issuance one time. If you developed uh, any cardiac, neurological, or mental health conditions since your last third class medical, you do not qualify for basic med. And we'll, it's, they're clearly specified what those things are and to have a valid driver's license. Um, I mentioned the valid part of this because uh, it is not uncommon for a pilot to come in to do the basic med and find out that their driver's license is no longer valid. And they forgot about it. Not that I could do something like that, but I can tell you that uh, maybe that has happened. Uh, under what circumstances do you need to do a, a, an aviation medical examination? Well, if you've never had a third class medical, you have to. So you can't just come off the, uh, decide to become a pilot take flight instruction and then uh, say, okay, now I want to go basic med. You got to go through the third class medical. That's the gatekeeper function that FA has now. And I don't see that really changing much unless we go to an expansion of the light sport aircraft. If your medical expired more than 10 years before the date of enactment in 2016, you can't have to go through the certification again. And if you don't know, FA can tell you whether or not you qualify for it or not. Now, when the legislation was passed and signed into law in 2016, they specified exactly what were the cardiovascular, neurological, or mental health issues that would be disqualifying for basic med. And if you had any of these, you need to get a one-time special issuance. So if you've had a heart attack, or if you've had um, a stent put in for coronary heart disease or a coronary artery bypass surgery, or if you've had a valve replaced or your heart replaced, all those things require one-time special issuance. You go, you notify the FAA um, and uh, you'll get a letter from them that tells you the same warm, fuzzy uh, uh, letter that uh, we're used to 
seeing uh, when people get de uh, uh, deferred. Um, and then you have to, you, you deal with it. Now there's, this brings up a point that uh, uh, a little bit of a sidetrack here. Let's say you have a, um, a disqualifying condition. Are you obligated to let the FA know immediately? My answer to that is no. You self ground, you don't fly with that condition, but that's, that's your deal. And um, rather than just rush and feel like we need to spill our guts to the FAA, my advice to pilots is just self ground. You're not, you're not violating anything. You're not violating any FARs by uh, keeping yourself as long as you self ground. And then it gives you a time to stop and take your pulse, talk to an AME, talk to somebody at AOPA uh, Medical, and get gather information so you can make a decision, uh, a good decision uh, before you proceed further. further. So I've seen uh, many times uh, the pilot will have something go wrong and they immediately let the FA know and they're like, holy smokes, you know, uh, then they're, they're got problems. Now there's also the back door that the FA has to finding some of this stuff out. It is not uncommon now for the FA to be sending letters to my pilots telling them that you got to submit this, this, and this because they've uh, somehow gotten a hold of your, your medical records and uh, have identified that you've had a, a, a disqualifying event. And uh, uh, I, uh, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later on about how, how that might uh, happen in the future. Neurological conditions, if you develop epilepsy, um, transient loss of central, uh, central nervous system functions without a satisfactory explanation, that is key. Same thing with disturb disturbances of consciousness without a, a satisfactory medical explanation. There are many things, for example, um, uh, passing out, um, losing consciousness. Uh, one of the most common reasons for that in my age group now that I'm in the 70 and over group is not drinking enough water. You know, you don't drink enough water, you go to bed, uh, you get up in the middle of the night to take a leak and boom, you get up real quickly, you develop postural hyper, hypotension and you pass out. Well, that's a, there's an explanation for that. You're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to signify that on your uh, FA examination for your third class medical you should probably tell your basic med exam doc that the same thing happened, but there's an explanation there. So the FA is not likely to cause any problems if there's an explanation. Another exam, example of this would be if you happen to have a transient ischemic attack, a so-called TIA, or a quote, pre-stroke, so to speak, if there's an explanation for that, it's definitely possible to get your special issuance uh, as long as there's an explanation for it and something that can be corrected. What the FAA does not want to have is a situation where a pilot loses consciousness uh, at any point in their life. There's not an explanation, so they can't predict when the next event's going to happen. And so uh, uh, this uh, uh, satisfactory explanation is really important. I want to give an example of this. There was a uh, physician out in uh, North Dakota, an OBGYN doc that I uh, worked with for many years, and a great doc, and he loved aviation. He was building a plane. And uh, he, uh, uh, by crawling in and out of this, uh, I think it was a Starduster that he bought from somebody who was partially completed uh, project, he hurt his back and he had to, he went in for a spinal fusion. Had the spinal fusion done and uh, wakes up and he had numbness and uh, uh, loss of movement on his left side. His wife called me right away and said, you know, I'll say Bill, Bill had a, a problem and he's, he can no longer fly. And so I happened to be going out there the next day to see him. And, you know, he was really down the dumps, you know, he had the uh, aviation was his passion and uh, he couldn't, he lost his medical. So he went through, he got, uh, uh, he was disabled. He couldn't operate any longer. Um, so he became medically dis disabled because of the fact that even though he rec rec recovered his feeling back within uh, 10, 15 minutes, but he had that on his record. Well, I was reading the Minnesota Flyer Magazine. There's a guy uh, that was uh, ran a column uh, about medical matters there. And uh, 
he was describing this doc from North Dakota who uh, had lost his medical because of the fact that he'd uh, had a stroke and uh, he got his medical back because he found out this doc was able to find out that there was a drug that was used during the surgery that had a side effect of causing stroke-like symptoms. And suddenly this gentleman had his medical back. Um, he was disabled, so he couldn't operate anymore, but he was retired and he was more than happy to see medical practice in his rear view mirror. So I don't know if you're watching tonight, sir, but I know, I know who you are and I think it's really a great story uh, uh, for you. So anyway, just something to keep in mind, having a, a satisfactory, satisfactory explanation is a really big deal. For mental health conditions, if you have a personality disorder that's severe enough to be have repeated uh, episodes, that's disqualifying. Psychosis, hallucinations, bipolar disorder, and substance dependence within the previous two years is defined by this FAR. I won't go into that, uh, the last one in detail, except to say that um, uh, substance dependence is a major problem, um, not only in the general population, but it's, it's also a problem for some pilots. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, for those of you, uh, I don't uh, know if you're all aware of an organization called Birds of a Feather. Birds of a Feather is a, uh, an Alcoholic Anonymous type organization um, that's completely anonymous and is for people that are having substance abuse problems, mainly alcohol. Um, you know, when you fill out your FA, uh, uh, third class, first, second, third class, there's a, the question down there, have you ever, have you had a DUI? And it turns out if you've had one DUI um, and your blood alcohol levels are not uh, above, I think it's 0.15, um, you can get your medical, you can get your medical and you have to acknowledge you've had that, had that on your record because they'll find out. Uh, and if they find out without you saying and letting them know that you did that, you've got major problems ever getting a medical in the future. It's virtually impossible to get it back. So you have to acknowledge you have it. If your blood alcohol is above 0.15, I believe that number is, you have to go through a, uh, evaluated by a psychiatrist or a psychologist, you have to go through a drug rehab, you have to go through a bunch of hoops. There are many people who have a drinking problem or a, a substance abuse problem that they can deal with it before they get themselves into trouble. And Birds of a Feather is a really good organization for doing that. Um, and so just something to pass on to your friends or colleagues who may have a drinking problem or an alcohol or a substance abuse problem, that this is a mechanism by which you might seek help and, uh, uh, and, and save uh, potential future problems. Basic Med, this is the landing page for AOPA. Um, I wanna also mention that there are two different uh, organizations that uh, you can do the Basic Med through. One of them is the, the world famous Mayo Clinic and the other one is AOPA. Um, having served on the faculty at the world famous Mayo Clinic for a number of years, I can tell you that um, for many reasons, I strongly recommend the AOPA course. Um, Mayo Clinic is a great place, a great place for some significant medical problems. But when you get on their mailing list, you'll be bombarded with things to promote uh, to donations to their foundation, which is fine, but it's a big foundation. AOPA has done a, a woman, they really were the ones that were responsible for getting basic med through. A EA helped, but it was mainly the persistence of Mark Baker and the crew that he assembled at AOPA to get this done. So you can see there's a nice little video here that you can uh, click on, uh, see how, uh, how that, uh, how the, an overview of the course. It's recommended in the United States, Mexico, the Bahamas, Dominican, Puerto Rico, you know, there's a number of places. The place that is markedly missing from here is Canada. And that is gonna be a challenge, I think. Uh, Mark Baker feels that they, he, they will achieve this at some point. But uh, COVID caused major problems with trying to get uh, an audience with the people up in Canada to get this uh, pushed through. He's working through a different plan to try to gain that. So uh, we're uh, hoping that Mark can get that uh, uh, achieved. Randy, not to interrupt. Um, yeah. 
Isn't that something to do with international recognition of it so that it wouldn't be just Canada, it'd be recognized almost anywhere? Yes. That's going to, uh, that's the approach he's going to use. Uh, that's the approach he's using through the ICAO. Uh, I don't remember what that stands for, but he's hoping that if he, if they can get that organization to do it, then they all have to say, oh, yep, we'll do it. So, yep. Thanks, Steve. That's a good point. Okay. Um, the different steps for basic med, get the basic form. Um, Your screen's not here. Just so you say again. Oh, oh, Your oh. Yep. Okay. You download the form, um, fill it out, uh, take the, you can do the test. They suggest you uh, do the, the test first, take it into your doc. They do the, the examination, complete that. Then you're good for uh, uh, four years. Take the online course, complete it. One word of advice about the online course. When you do the online course, it takes about a half an hour, 40 minutes to go through it. And at the end of it, you have to do it. You do a test and you're tested on the, uh, uh, you're tested on the contents of that um, uh, course. And you got to get an 80% to pass it. And if you don't get the 80%, well, let me back up. When you take the test, if you hit the wrong answer, it tells you what the right answer is. Um, and so write it down, you know, write it down on a piece of paper. And then if you get the end of the test and you don't get the 80%, you have the option of going back and redoing the whole course and take the test again, or you have the option of just uh, doing the, uh, the test again. And then you got the right answers all written down there. So a little bit of gamesmanship in terms of um, um, uh, passing that is uh, in order. So you take the online course and um, you pass it, you complete it, and we'll sh I'll show you the critical parts of that. And then you file it in your logbook. You make a logbook entry that you did your basic med examination on this date, and then you're off to the races. You get a certificate, and um, and you're good to go. Okay, now hang on here. Um, on their uh, uh, website, they have a tool that you can use. You go through and answer questions, and it tells you whether or not you're, uh, you could do it or not, whether you're qualified for it. I bring this one up because over on the left-hand side here, you can see a bunch of different things you can click on to get information. So for example, uh, you could talk about uh, basic med special issuance. What do you need to consider for that? What are some common disqualifications? You can download the form. You can find a doctor. And um, so it's really, uh, really a nice tool. Um, the doctor is all listed here. This is, I just pulled up from my zip code. Um, unfortunately, my address and the phone number is incorrect. So one of the beauties of this presentation tonight is I'll go in and get that corrected. But you can see who does them. Um, um, and uh, what it doesn't tell you is, are these good docs or not? I don't know, this will be, could be a real shocker to you all, but did you know that not all doctors are, are created the same? And, uh, um, the joke is, what do you call the person who finishes last in their medical school class? Doctor. And uh, there is a sad truth that goes with that. So uh, there's a place on there for physicians to click on to find out whether or not, what is this basic med thing about? And they can, each one of these is a drop down menu that they can go through if they're so led to do so. Um, again, the qualifications are an MD, a DO, a chiropractor in some states, dentist, podiatrist, not so much. You fill out the pilot self-assessment form before you visit, go to the doctor um, and come in with that already filled out. The doctor then has access to the uh, basic med physician guide. And I'm, I'm putting this up here, not expecting anybody to read it, except for you just to understand what the doctor would need to go through to become educated as to what to uh, whether they want to participate in this or not. So you got this part, these pages, these pages. Then you have the instructions on how to, to fill out the form. This part, the instructions for you on filling out your part. But then there's a part for your uh, physician to fill out as well. And then here's the comprehensive uh, uh, list. And you'll see that uh, this is looks very similar to what you fill out uh, uh, online for uh, MedExpress. And then the last part, 
And then here's the instructions for the doc to read through and uh, understand and complete it. And this is what a lot of docs will look like once they, you hit them out of the cold as to, are you kidding me? Uh, because physicians for better or for worse nowadays are really trapped into seeing a lot of patients in a short period of time. And uh, they are not, many of them are not gonna take the time to figure this out. They're gonna take your word for it, is my experience. They're gonna take the word for it, yeah, this is a good thing, or they're gonna say, no, I'm not gonna do it. It's easier to say no than to say, yeah, I'll think about it. So, so you complete the basic form, um, you see your doctor, you fill out the course, you file the documents in your logbook. And 24 months later, you get out your most recent uh, uh, forms. Remember the ones you are supposed to have tucked away with your logbook or in a safe place? Because you gotta have that last page so you can enter in the, doc, the information about your doc to complete that uh, renewal. Take the online course, pass it, Make sure you write down the right answers if you get some wrong, and then uh, file the documents in your logbook and off you, off you go. Okay, I'm gonna dip through these. So what do you do after 48 months, after four years? Probably the greatest catcher in the history of baseball, Yogi Berra. And it's deja vu all over again. You gotta go through and do the same hoops again. Get the basic med form, see your doc, do the course, file the documents in your logbook. This hey Randy, is, yeah. can I ask a pop, can I ask a pop up yeah. question? Um, I, I just heard about a guy and actually his wife that um, uh, let their basic meds expire. Is there any penalty, or you just reapply? Just reapply. No penalty. Yep, doesn't doesn't hurt a thing. Same thing like with your third class medical. You can let it expire if you miss it. You just go back in, sign up again, and off you go. Yep, good question. Okay, I'm gonna go back here, screen share, share. Um, this is the website uh, for um, the basic med for getting started in the course. And I, I encourage people to pre-flight for the physical. This is the checklist for the 210. And I go through this checklist every time I fly, uh, even though I've done it a lot, many times going through this, but the first time I don't, I'm worried I'll miss something. The same thing true with your flight physicals, you folks, you gotta, you gotta make sure you got your poop in a pile before you walk in the office. Um, it's very frustrating for you and for the doc if you don't do that. You gotta be honest and write down. If you have any questions before you start the exam, before you give them the confirmation number for FA medical exams, uh, ask the questions. Say, okay, now I'm ready to give my confirmation number. And if you made something and entered it when you did your uh, Med Express, your doc can, the AME is, qual is uh, given with your permission to make changes in the database. So you're not roped into the error that you made um, before. So you do your checklist before you go in to do your physical exam to make sure you have things together. Don't forget to bring your reading glasses along with you. If you're in the age group where you need reading glasses, make sure you don't have an empty bladder uh, because you gotta have about that, just a tiny amount of urine in the bottom of the cup to check. And if you're wondering, no, what are we checking? Uh, we're checking for protein and glucose. We're not checking for drugs. We're checking for um, just sugar and protein, uh, screening for diabetes and screening for uh, kidney disease. So there's two sections, the individual section that you fill out, Form 18, those conditions any time in your life. And with the FAA, you, you can put down previously reported. Now, everything you put down as a yes in the FAA, uh, in the, either the FAA uh, Med Express or in the basic med, the doc has got to write something in that block to explain what that yes was about. If it was previously reported, I just write previously reported. Same thing, what you should write uh, as well. Um, this is the list of the different things uh, that you need to uh, say yes or no to. Anything that's a yes, if you previously reported for FAA, you, you check it, put an explanation down. 
What about basic med? Basic med is a different beast because of the fact that with that one, you become my patient and I don't know what you previously reported. So the first time you go to the doc for a basic med examination, one good plan of attack is to make sure you're gonna to go to the same doc uh, for years to come, if that's possible to determine that. Because if you go into a, another uh, physician in another practice, they don't have access to your, like, your medical records from the past. And so you gotta go through the whole thing again. Here's the form you fill out for MedExpress, very, identical with FA Medical. You know, common things, medications, prescription, non-prescription uh, non medications, write them down. Um, anything again that you put a yes to over on the right-hand side, you can see there's a place then for the doc to write something, for you to write it in there. Just write it in. What I do is I just initial it then once I get to my part. And then at the bottom, you check that you've had, you've been complete and uh, truthful with your uh, um, answers. You print it and sign it, and off you go. Uh, medication, we're gonna skip over that. Okay, the part for the doc. This is a form that we fill out for this, and this is woefully inadequate in my opinion. I mean, it doesn't ask for anything in terms of uh, vision, for example, down at the bottom, distant, near, and intermediate vision, field of vision, color vision, ocular alignment. Many of the docs don't have access to that in their offices. And uh, if they check it off, they say that they feel that there's not a problem with that. Um, I, I choose to use a different approach. This is the form, you folks that I fill out when I do a third class, second class medical examination, uh, same thing true for a first class for the senior medical AMEs. I fill this, whoops. I fill this out exactly for basic med like I do a third class medical. And my reason for doing that is I'm figuring if there's a problem in the future, I can go back to this and say, hey, look, you bozos. I did this examination exactly like I do at my second and third class medical. So I have some sort of a legal leg to stand on that I examine this person using the same uh, criteria. And I offer this for you, for your physicians. If you wanna tell your physicians about this, uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, I'll have my email address. I'll be happy to send this form. This is just a blank form, you know, that I just printed out uh, uh, for my uh, pilots. I made a, took a blank one, put in my information to the bottom of it, send and make a bunch of copies and I just fill it out. And I include that then with my uh, information that I, the copies that I give to you. This is the most important page for you to keep track of for the future when you do your two re year renewal. They wanna know in the bottom of this form, my contact information, what state, my medical license number, all this stuff. And that's important. They keep track of it. For basic med, the physician has to be licensed in the state in which he or she performed the examination. For the FA medicals, they designate where you can do the, exam the examinations. So, for example, in, in New Holstein, uh, at the Super Cup Fly-In, I've done uh, basic med exams there. And I do them just like I do my third class medicals. And I can do that there because I'm licensed in Wisconsin. I'm licensed in North Dakota, Montana, Alaska. But for the for FAA medicals, I can't do them there. I can only do them in the cities and the locations where they tell me that I can do them. And you sign it and off you go. So again, review of the basic med. Uh, things, you have a valid driver's license, complete your section, the physician completes their section, you do the course either before or after you do this, put the documents in your logbook or put them in a safe place and make a logbook entry saying I've completed basic med on this date. You have to have that in there. If you don't have that in there, um, it can cause you problems down the road. And I just put them in my, I put them those entry, that entry in my logbook. I don't put my uh, basic med in this, I just put it, um, um, I just put it in a different uh, spot and put them in your uh, flight bag 
or in your billfold. Uh, for me, I just keep mine um, in my billfold and I've got like, okay. So this is the basic med form, oh, craps. Okay, Steve. At any rate, there's a little form that you can get that uh, you print out Plus the your personal out. information. Um, and and I just uh, I laminate my uh, medical FA medical, so I've got that. Oh, there we go. So I got my FA medical. I've got my basic med. The point of doing all that is that if you get ramp checked, they're going to want to see something. And you can't just say, I got a basic med exam. I have a basic med certification. If you do that, you got, you're got you going to have 72 hours to produce that documentation to your local FISDO, which can be a major pain in the ass. So my vote would be just keep those with you, and um, uh, that will be helpful. Okay, I'm going to go back. Andy, uh, somebody asked, and I was going to ask the exact same question. Can you just keep a copy on your phone? Can you take a picture of it and use it that way? Or do you actually need the physical paper copies? Well, I think that's a great idea. Most states accept a driver's license on a phone now too, which is nice, but. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep, no, I think that's a great idea. Okay. So maintain your basic med privileges. You make sure you keep your checklist so that you can show that you've had it done in the previous uh, 48 months. Make sure you're being treated by a physician for medical conditions that can affect the safety of flight. And um, every 24 months, you got to do the online course. Okay, hang on here. Now, uh, what, what I wanted, a point I wanted to make there. Yeah, I'm moving on. So just for your information, the FAA has 15 disqualifying conditions that are used there, all these are disqualifying conditions. Chest pain, angina, bipolar, cardiac valve, coronary artery disease, diabetes, requiring insulin or, hy or oral hypoglycemic medications like glucophage, uh, disturbances of consciousness without an explanation, epilepsy, heart replacement, MIs, pacemakers, personality disorders, psychoses, substance abuse, transit loss of CNS function, i.e. TIAs, uh, strokes. There are a lot of other things that go wrong with human beings. Um, and so, to th so it's important to understand that. And that's why it's important, in my opinion, to carry a basic med at the same time that you have your third class medical or your second class or your first class medical. Because if you have one of these disqualifying conditions that comes up, they're not listed there that are gonna require a special issuance, for the vast majority of them, you'll get your special issuance. But it might take you a long time to get your special issuance. So in the meantime, your super cub is sitting in the hangar because you can't legally fly it. So I think uh, that's really important to know. I just listed some of the common ones that men and women are, uh, 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 are suffering from cancers, kidney stones, thyroid disease, diabetes, sleep apnea, that's a huge one, mild depression. Those are things that are not disqualifying for basic med, but are for uh, requiring a special issuance for the FAA. Now that's, that's important for us because if you carry both of these things at the same time, you can fly your, Super Cub until you get your uh, special issuance back. Again, there's a review of how the difference between basic med and third class medicals go. Now I wanna cover something here just briefly. Keep in mind that your medical examination expires after four years from the date of the exam. Your online course expires at the end of the month, two years thereafter, okay? So let's say, this pilot goes in, does a basic med examination this coming October 1st. It's gonna expire on October 1st of 2027. He or she goes on, does the online course on the same day, expires on this date. They go in and they decide, we're gonna just wait till the expiration of this happens and I'm gonna renew the course on November the 1st of 2025. The problem then 
is the pilot does not have a valid medical between October the 2nd and October the 14th. So I kind of drew this out for you. You can see that there's this gap at the end where he or she does not have a valid medical. Now this happened to one of our Super Cub buddies that he got a call from the local FISDO that somebody turned him in uh, uh, because he was operating, he was doing flight instruction without a valid medical. And in fact, that person was. Uh, and so they had to, to get, they had to offer an explanation about what's going on. Um, change gears here for a second. What happens if the base of med doc changes his or her mind and feels that you no longer, that that person doesn't want to certify you as being okay with basic med? Can they, re can they revoke your basic med? For example, what these we know these are known reasons why uh, they're disqualifying, but any condition that I feel when I issue a basic med exam that I know no longer feel comfortable with that person operating on an aircraft safely, I I want to have a, a mechanism by which I can uh, uh, say no, I'm not okay with signing this anymore. From a, letter, a medical liability standpoint, it's a huge deal, you know, and so. One of the things I ask basic med people that I do exams on and certify, if something changes, I wanna know. Now, what am I gonna do if I do wanna decertify? Well, I checked with the FAA last week. There is no algorithm by which I can go in and invalidate a basic med exam. Weirdly enough, since this falls outside of FAA Air Medical, they don't want to know about it. It lands on the FISDO. And so the only way that I could do that is to call the FAA hotline and report that I no longer feel that this pilot is operating with a valid medical. Now that's a drastic step, but something I think is important for pilots to understand that if there's something if I sign your basic med exam and something changes about your health, you develop a cancer, for example, you develop prostate cancer. For me, unless there's something really weird about it, I have no problem certifying, keeping that basic med thing going. But, but my buddy down the road may not feel that way. He may not want to put his financial future in jeopardy because of the fact that uh, if there's a complication that comes from the uh, prostate cancer that can lead to a problem with you crashing an airplane. Same thing with hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, those sorts of things. Those are some conditions by which I want to know if there's a change. I don't want to call the FA hotline and say, hey, uh, Joe Schmo has a medical condition that I feel no longer is valid under basic med. And the FISDO then is going to be uh, uh, sending out the notice to the pilot that uh, something needs to happen. And what my understanding is they will just simply ground them immediately until this has been resolved. I wanna to touch briefly on ADHD. One of the things that uh, is very sad uh, in my practice is uh, with uh, med medical examinations is having young people that decide they want to do and develop a career in aviation. They come in for their flight physical. Um, uh, for example, you, University of North Dakota, some of the other uh, University of Minnesota down in, in Mankato. These kids come in, they're encouraged to get their medical done before they start their training, start their college. And uh, they're on, uh, they've been on Adderall. And the FA, does, it's disqualifying. And unfortunately, these, uh, disorders are not, they're not scrupulously um, examined before the diagnosis is made. So there can be some people that are just hyper, hyper, hyper people. You know, they're probably troublemakers in their uh, grade school class, Steve Johnson. Um, they're just a little bit hyperactive and they don't have a, de a deficit hyperactivity disorder, so to speak, but the way a lot of people and parents are pushing physicians to write out for something. I want something for my kid because they're hyper. Well, that's great until the time comes. So they want to do uh, FA, uh, get certification. So the FA updated 
on uh, August the 30th of this year, how we deal with that. And here's the, here's the algorithm that I'm gonna briefly cover. If I have a no to all these questions, I can issue a, medical, a valid medical on the date of the examination. They have had no treatment in the past four years. They've had no symptoms of it in the last four years. They have no instability in academic, occupational, social functioning in the last four years, and no other psychiatric conditions. I have to have a letter from the doc who's prescribing the medications to say, to confirm that this is true. That's a big deal. This is the if, if those are not met and any of those there's an answer no to at the deferred Oklahoma City, and this is the sort of thing that has to go on, they have to be complete, see a him certified psychologist or neuropsychologist. They go through testing. The medications to be stopped, has to be stopped for nine days before testing and evaluation. Um, it's a big hoop. This is all the paperwork, you guys. I just... Uh, uh, made this slide of this just to show the sorts of things that the young person has to go through to be able to receive a special issuance for ADHD and having been on Adderall. It's it's a big deal. So I, I really, uh, really want to stress for, for you all to keep this in mind with your young people that you interact with uh, that and, and to parents to really stress that you really need to make sure this diagnosis is correct before they get started on some of these medications that can cause troubles. Another thing that can happen is we're, we're going along and uh, uh, driving a car and we start feeling not very good. We might pull over, or we might be at home and uh, I just can't remember something, something I just did. And my speech might be a little bit slurred. I might have a little bit of weakness in my right or left side. And, uh, uh, and I take him to the hospital and um, to the emergency room. They evaluate me and say, you've had a TAI, a transient ischemic attack. And they do a bunch of tests to see what's going on, as they should, uh, as we'd want them to. This is the information that if you've had a transient ischemic attack uh, that needs to be done. This is what the FA wants done. Or if you've had a stroke. And you can see it's, a, it's an extensive list of things. They wanna make sure you don't have something about your carotids are partially occluded. They wanna make sure you don't have something, uh, a patent ovale uh, foramen in your heart that connects the upper chambers of your heart that doesn't close like it should be when you're born, that causes the blood flow to not go through appropriately through the upper change of, uh, chamber of the heart that causes a blood clot to form. Um, Holter monitor, make sure you don't have uh, atrial fibrillation, you know, cardiac monitoring. So it's an extensive list of things. Interestingly enough, when I posed this question to the FAA just last week, TIAs are not listed as a disqualifying condition for basic med. The key here is that there's an ex, there can be, a, there needs to be an explanation for it for me, from, from my perspective, I have you signed up for basic med. So if the person had this happen, they've recovered, there's no deficit, they're, they're mentating just fine. They're talking, they have their motor skills are still fine. If they identified, for example, at atrial fibrillation, boom, I got an explanation. That can be treated. And under those circumstances, I'd feel fine with that pilot exercising the privileges of basic med. But I can tell you some, some docs may not feel comfortable with that. And that's fair game. One of the things that's nice about basic med too is if you find one doc who's not willing to do it, on even your initial basic med, and they get halfway through the exam and they say, you know what, uh, I'm not gonna certify you for this. You can go down the road to somebody else and get another answer, get a second opinion. There's no downside of doing that. The FA does not know that you've done that. 
Okay. Um, that's that part. Now I want to change the, his, uh, Steve, has Richard McSpadden joined us? I don't, I don't see that he has, but I've got, um, I've got his notes. We can talk about um, that from our little email conversation this morning. Would you like to do that, Steve? Certainly. Uh, hey, well, let me let me just describe it. I have a slide made up for it. This thing called um, modernization of special airworthiness cert certification. Uh, uh, Richard McSpadden was kind enough to offer to be able to speak about this tonight, and. Uh, he could join us early and I asked him not to join us early because this, if this goes through, which it sounds like it's likely to, everything we just talked about is gonna go out the window because basically, and you'll see why. If this goes through, it eliminates some light sport aircraft limitations like the 1320 pounds goes away, the 120 knot speed restriction goes away. It replaces, the, uh, with re performance-based measures, you have to have a 54 knot maximum clean speed, stall speed. So that means if you have your flaps up, your landing gear up, your stall speed cannot be above 54 knots. You can weigh up to 3,000 pounds. You can have a constant speed prop. You can have retractable gear, up to four seats allowed. You can only carry one passenger, top speed 250 knots. You have to have a sport pilot, a sport pilot certification. You have to have a valid driver's license. You've been found to be eligible for issuance of a third class medical. It doesn't mean you have to have a third class medical, but you have to be able to have received one. You've not had your medical suspended or revoked. You've not had a special issuance withdrawn. And lastly, you do not know or have reason to know of any medical condition that would make that person unable to operate a light uh, sport aircraft in a safe manner. That's a that's a quite a that's quite a thing quite a change. So Steve, with that, I'll leave that and I'll stop this sh this sharing here for a second. Um, I think you all can see why this would have a major impact for most of the planes that we fly. So uh, a couple of things about Mosaic also, uh, this is this is an FAA thing they're doing it. You can tell by the acronym, of course, that it's an FAA thing. Um, but um, it, uh, as Richard pointed out, uh, this can be really good for general aviation in many ways. Um, it's in the public comment period currently. The public comment period was supposed to end at the end of October, but they've had so many comments on this, I assume probably lots of positive comments, um, that they possibly will extend it some. So this is not something that's 10 years off. This is something that, uh, if it works out, could could happen relatively soon. And uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, could, be, could be really good for all of us. Another thing to point out, um, currently, if you look at the way Mosaic uh, the kind of the first draft of it is written, it talks about a 52 or 54 knot stall speed and a maximum gross weight of 3000 pounds or something like that. Well, there's some negotiation going on for those speeds so that uh, it could be because that would preclude things like a Piper Archer, which stalls at 55 knots instead of 54. So uh, or that kind of thing. So they're trying to make sure that it makes sense that it's a performance based evaluation rather than just saying an airplane that weighs 1,320 pounds or whatever the whatever the uh, uh, original light sport was. So I think it's going to be it's going to be really great if this thing goes through for a lot of people. Great. Um, Do you want to the reauthor real quick too while we're here on the subject? Say again. You want to talk about reauthorization? Go ahead. So um you know, uh, the FAA reauthorization, uh, which is a bazillion, gazillion dollar thing, uh, um, um, is the kind of the million dollars waiting on a dime situation right now. Um, there's very little chance that it's going to get done by September 30th, of course, which is also the government shutdown date this year. Um, it's stalled in the Senate. And the reason it's stalled uh, is largely due to to age concerns, uh, part 121, which is uh, air carrier operations with age concerns and hours of experience rules. 
And a lot of the hangup is around how much simulator time can be counted in that experience. So it's a very small piece. Uh, there's no hangups at all on any of the general aviation things that are going on with the reauthorization, which there's some good stuff there too. One of the things that's good, uh, and I know uh, actually three DPEs that could take advantage of this, um, is the possibility of uh, DPEs being able to operate under basic med. So currently DPEs have to carry a class medical to uh, to operate. And so that would be great, great for some folks. Because one of the, when you, obviously we need DPEs. It's like uh, knowing some locally, it is uh, really, uh, um, it's really a problem. <laughs> These guys are as busy as they want to be, so. You know, one thing, uh, and I, Steve and I have talked about this before, one of the problems I have with the reauthorization bill is that part of the language in there is something the FAA has been wanting for a long time, and that is immediate access to our, elect to our medical records. So if this goes through, the language right now is such that when you sign that and you get your confirmation number, you are agreeing to let the FAA have access to all of your medical records. Now, the concern I have with that is that, you know, we, I don't want to encourage our pilots to lie about anything or be misleading in any answers they put down. But some things you can't control that could get us into trouble when well-meaning people in the healthcare uh, uh, industry, nurses, physicians, whatever else, can write something in your chart that really is not accurate. So for example, if they passed out um, or they had chest pain, you know, back in the days before Google searches and search engines, some poor person in a cubicle in Oklahoma City would be sitting there looking at a stack like this thick, trying to go through and find something that was uh, um, could be potentially a problem for a, disqualific a disqualifying event. Now with the search engine, they can real easily zip through it and, and come up with things. And with electronic medical record, it makes it even more easy to do this. So I, I wish I wish that part was not in there. And I verbalized this to uh, to Mark Baker, and um, it was pointed out to me that there's some give and take with a lot of different things. That one of the things that they're trying to get in this is to increase the gross weight of the airplanes up to 13,000 pounds, which allows some people to fly their caravans and that sort of thing under basic med. And I, my concern is that the trade-off there is not going to be maybe in the best interest of most of us. So, yep. Okay, um, I'm going to share one more thing here. Oh yeah, go. Okay, okay. okay hang on here. So while you're, do, while you're doing that, I was just going to say um, that uh, I was. To, I wanted to be clarify that you cannot carry a telephone copy of your class three medical. Uh, that is not allowed. You have to have a paper copy of that. And, but you can laminate it. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I'm legal then. So at any anyway, rate, uh, in conclusion, that's that. If other questions come up, uh, let us know. This is the other end of, uh, of uh, backside of that. There's my uh, contact information. Um, up uh, on the screen. I'll try to go on supercub.org and put that on also on a post uh, someplace, but greatplanesame at gmail.com. Um, and this is a Google number that I have, 651-243-2220. I go by wind in his nose at supercub.org. Um, so feel free to let me know if you have questions or concerns. Many of you do. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to pay back some stuff that this, this website and this organization has led to some of the, my most important friendships. And uh, I uh, really, uh, really value this, this group of people. So uh, anybody have anything that you wanna bring up? Now I got to, Laura. Brandy, um, someone had posted, it was really a comment, but maybe you can address it either from basic med or from a regular medical standpoint. Um, this person said that they have a class three medical exam and he's been deferred because after losing his spouse, he had been um, prescribed trazodone and sertaline and he didn't, it didn't agree with him. So he quit taking it. 
but now he's kind of in a holding pattern. Any comments on that? Yeah. Uh, the FA allows situational depression to be treated uh, without going through the four year. Uh, this was uh, six years ago. Yeah. Uh, in my, my experience with this is if I get a letter from the doc who wrote the prescription, ideally, to say this person no longer needs it, it was for situation depression, like loss of a loved one, um, that the FA will let, will let that go. Well, that would not be a problem. But I would really encourage you to that person to raise that question to contact the, the AME, make sure they understand, uh, understand what the situation was and um, uh, get a letter from the doc if you possibly can. But you know, for common sense, there's a lot of people that don't stay in touch uh, with their doc for you know four years ago for something like this. So I don't see that would be a major problem at all. Yep. As opposed to ADHD stuff, man, they're really hard on that. And it's, it's very frustrating. What else, what other things, Laura? Um, the only other thing I see was um, about the third class medical in your in that you're carrying. You have to have the front and the back. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I've had people. I heard that people have cut that thing in two, and uh, you know, instead of carrying the whole thing, what I do is I just I I put the front. And then on the back, I've got the other part and I laminate it. So it goes through the washing machine. Okay, I'll tell you something else I do that the FA does not care for. And that is, uh, it's been alleged that when I print out the certificate that I do two copies. One for them to carry with them and one to keep in a safe place in case you lost your, your, your it went through the laundry. and. Not that that's ever happened to me, but by golly, I got laminated now. It ain't going to ever happen again. Um, so, um, but you got to have both parts of it, weirdly enough. So what the heck? Hmm. That's all I see. Anybody is listening, have anything else? This is, this is your time. You're being shy. Jim Crane, how are you? You're good. Okay. Someone nope. says he's not allowed to unmute. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's okay. We'll <laughs> we'll let it go. And Charles we'll wants to. We'll Charles it. wants. Hang on. Let okay. me unmute. Let me unmute Charles. Try that, Charles. You should be able to unmute now. Can you hear me now? Loud and yes, clear. Sir. All right. So I'm not able to get my camera to work, but uh, I had a. Quick question about ADHD. Um, so the four years is absolutely mandatory uh, and also a retest, but not just a retest. The four years is mandatory uh, yeah. to be off prescription. So for me to be able to issue that on the day of the exam, that doesn't mean you can't get a special issuance before right. that. But they're going to they're going to require you to go through. The psychiatric psychological evaluation, the psychological testing, get enrolled in the HEMS program. HEMS, I don't remember what that acronym stands for, but it's basically AMEs who specialize in uh, substance abuse. Okay. Yep. And then I would be able to get a special issuance if I can get through that. Yep. Um, okay. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. And you probably no, will. You probably will. Thanks. It's just that they're going to require you to. Uh, uh, see a psychologist, but they specify who these people are um, and the FA will tell you who the possibilities are. Uh, overall, for people who live even close to the world famous Mayo Clinic, it's just easier to go there. Um, FA feels that the Mayo Clinic walks on water, seriously. And so when I've had pilots that have had problems that um, cardiology problems, for example, that the their local doc has done a good job and they feel there's no reason why they can't fly. Um, the FA goes, nope, we want an approved uh, cardiologist to uh, uh, wave them through. And so uh, 
Mayo's got a nice system and they have an aeromedical division and they can real quickly get referrals to docs in that system to get things taken care of relatively quickly. Um, FA really doesn't trust uh, a lot of docs and they feel that there's no, um, they don't, don't understand the aeromedical part of this, which I kind of understand, but I kind of don't. Um, it's, uh, it's very frustrating for, for us when we have that sort of a situation. So I think it's very, um, important to point out here too for folks listening, because this has really come up a lot. There are, there are plenty of young folks, and I say young folks because if, if it had been around when I was a kid, I'm sure that I would be dealing with it because my parents just used to threaten me with tranquilizers, actually, uh, like they used on Wild Kingdom, if you remember that. Um, so, <laughs> so they, uh, but there's a tremendous number of young people taking these uh, kinds of medications. And part of the reason they're taking them is to concentrate better for as simply as simple as things as trying to concentrate better in class, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and so it's, so it's important to recognize that, um, uh, you know, these aren't all people with, with, you know, kind of serious psychological problems or whatever that are taking these medications. Yep. Jim Crane, what are you doing? You're unmuted. I want to answer any question. Okay, let's hear it. Would it be okay to use your bullet points this evening about my advice to keep your poop in a pile? You bet. Thank you. I'm going to use that tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Now, keeping your poop in the pile is a really important <laughs> deal when it comes to this. And, you know, pre-flighting before your flight physical, so it's not the last minute you come in, there's problems. So, yep. Good. Anybody else have any questions this evening? Uh, you got Randy's contact information. You can also find him on the uh, medical matters form of supercub.org uh, where he will answer questions and all that sort of thing. And, or you can private message him or whatever through there. So, uh, you know, we all, uh, a lot of us go through life thinking, you know, no big deal. We're always going to get a class three medical. And I happen to work around a lot of really young people who would just can't even imagine not getting a medical and uh, but it happens. And so it's great to have a resource like you, Randy, where people can just reach out and even ask simple questions about what's the direction to go. And uh, you have proven to be invaluable to many folks in that. And we really appreciate that Thank and you. appreciate your time this evening. Tell My them pleasure. The anonymous anonymous uh, poster for the medical matters. Say that again. I was asking Steve to tell them the way to do an anonymous post on medical matters. Oh yeah, on the medical matters forum, one of the first posts uh, in there allows you to. Uh, there's a way you can log in so that you are a uh, can post your question anonymously as well too, and then other people benefit from it as well. So. Yep. All right. Thank you very much, Randy. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Ted Waltman next month. Looking forward to it, Ted. Sounds good. Goodbye. Okay,